Hi, and welcome to Kidney Plugged In. Joining us on the show today is a very special guest, Alvin Clark. Alvin received a kidney from his brother, a living donor match. This year, Alvin will be celebrating his ninth year as a kidney transplant recipient. And today he shares his personal story of tribulation and triumph as he reflects back on his lifelong journey living with nephrogenic diabetes and syphilis. Alvin, a strong self-advocate, has some valuable insights and advice for others who may be facing their own journey living with kidney disease. So stay with us because Alvin will be joining us next right here on Kidney Get me in. Hi everyone, I'm very pleased today to welcome Mr. Alvin Clark, who's here to tell us about his inspiring story full of advocacy, twists and turns, and ultimately having a kidney transplant eight years ago. Thanks for joining us here today. Oh, thanks for having me. So Alvin, you were born with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, NDI, which was the start of your lifelong journey with diabetes. Can you take us back to that time and tell us what you learned? The way it was described to me when I first started out is a lot of people will have maybe two dozen filters, like coffee filters, to filter their, their urine where I'll have two or three. So I have much higher flow of, of uh, water throughput through my body than a normal person. Um, when I was younger, my drinking glass literally was a two-quart jug and I could drink it down my stomach would distend and then you could watch it as my body absorbed the water like a sponge. Wow. And uh, that carried on right up until I had my transplant. So um, it created issues for me socially because if I followed my urge to pee, I'd be going every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, that created problems during school, things like that. It uh, created uh, other issues. So what I started doing is uh, I would hold and hold it and hold it. And one of the side effects of that as a kid is I always used to walk around with a pot belly and it wasn't fat, it was because my bladder was so distended. Um, I could hold almost two liters a year before I had to void. So that, that created uh, some interesting issues growing up. Uh, the other problem that I had is because I had to have so much water, um, I would sit at the water fountain for five minutes drinking steady at school and I would have teachers physically pull me away from the water fountain and I would go back to it because I'm just following my instinct. I needed water, I took water. It was interesting for me through that process of self-discovery because I've always been off the medical protocols growing up and um, I was a wasting baby syndrome, I was losing weight. so. They kept taking me back to the doc, doctor, and then Dr. Baird, Angus Baird was my doctor at the time. He uh, convinced uh, Dr. Henry Dunn from UBC, an endocrinologist, to take my case. And he finally diagnosed me having NDI at uh, 15 months old. 15 months old. Yes. So it was only my mother's instincts up until that 15 month diagnosis that kept me alive because she always maintained um, my water intake. That's incredible. Yeah. So how does NDI impact your kidneys? Um, what it does is the glomerulus is distended and uh, that's usually if there's any damage that's where it's going to be and the bigger issue is they're always worried about distended bladder. Well maintaining water intake was difficult, uh, depended on what I was doing, etc. I was always very active as a kid. Um, I grew up in the age where we didn't have a TV until I was 12. Dad didn't believe in it. Uh, there was no internet, there were no games, so um, their solution was is we got up in the morning, fed breakfast, we were outside and uh, playing with the neighborhood. When you say maintaining water intake, how many liters did that look like? Liters? I can go in gallons. Let's go in gallons <laughs> um, I probably, around that, during my childhood, four or five gallons a day, easy without thinking. As I got older, I, I didn't require as much. But part of the requirement uh, for the water intake is when I started to restrict it, um, I was running around and I was always borderline dehydrated. And that is where the stress on the kidney comes from with NDI is, is not being fully hydrated. And then as an adult, uh, prior to my transplant, um, I was averaging in the wintertime about 10 liters per day or roughly three gallons. 
and uh, in the summer it would go up to about 15 just to maintain hydration levels. So you really were a water connoisseur. Oh yeah, no, I was a water hog. <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't let NDI hold you back at all. It sounds like you've had quite a few fitness challenges and adventures. Well, Do you want to walk us through that a little bit? The way I was raised, I wasn't raised like I was in um, different from anybody else. Mm -hmm. Like. Uh, I didn't find out again until I was older that uh, dad wouldn't let me play lacrosse because I was always quite small and frail. Um, I went into grade eight. I was just over four foot six and maybe 80 pounds, but um, I uh, was very, very small. I wanted to play football all the time when I was younger and I, <laughs> by the time I made the weight, minimum weight to play football, I was too old. So I was small and um, grew up in a big family and we're all rough and tumble so I just rolled with the punches and, and went with it. It's an uh, interesting upbringing. I didn't discover that uh, I was on BC's handicap list for children until I was in grade nine when uh, a bunch of us got called down to the office and the uh, receptionist announced to the office that I was on the handicap list. Well, I just blew up because I wasn't handicapped. I'm not a natural athlete, but I've managed to work hard enough that uh, I was moderately successful in my athletic career. I'm, I made some pretty good teams and, and managed to keep up with it. So I'm, I've all, always been a little on a portly side, but when I was younger, I was always out doing something. Do you have any memorable you know, races, runs, marathons that you want to tell us about? The best advice my wife gave me is she got me involved in a fitness club. And uh, the fitness club's point of view was, we're not just here to have you go through and do exercises. You'll have a destination that you'll train to do. So with that club, we hiked Machu Picchu. We uh, did the uh, south rim of the Grand Canyon. We hiked down to the river and back in one day. We hiked the West Coast Trail in three days. We did the rides for uh, Conquer Cancer with them. I did the Grand Fondo with them. Uh, the Portland to, uh, or on Seattle to Portland, I rode twice with them to do that. And they got, got me into that at, aspect of it. I call it my midlife crisis because that's when we got into all the athletics. Up until I t uh, tore, did a partial tear in my lamina doing weightlifting. <laughs> that's incredibly inspiring. So in 1990, 30, 34 years ago, you met your GP, Dr. Christine Whittington, who was going to have a huge impact on your life, professionally and medically. Do you want to talk about how this part of the journey impacted you? Well, I'm fairly stubborn when it comes to uh, working through issues. So the first time that I, I doc, met Dr. Whittington, I went in thinking I was had the flu and I was limping. And uh, so she's sort of doing my assessment and it turned out that I was operating on a quarter of a lung. So at the end of the, uh, my very first meeting with her, uh, she gave me uh, an ultimatum. I'll let you drive to the hospital and you call me within 15 minutes or I'm calling the police. So that was my introduction to her bedside manner. And I liked the honesty mm -hmm. and I liked the rawness. So from that, she was asking me why I was limping and uh, I told her, well, I suffered from chronic gout. So she took an interest in that. Um, she was uh, trained um, in Australia, and she told me Australia has a very low level of inflammatory diseases. So she wanted to try to help me with the gout, and then she found out I had NDI, and that also piqued her interest as well. So you weren't surprised when Dr. Whittington began talking to you about looking at a transplant. Were you relieved? How did that process look? Uh, I was relieved that she was uh, talking about um, me getting a transplant. I did a lot of research ahead of it. I came to the, my own personal conclusion that 
no matter what form of dialysis you are on, it's living health. Uh, the amount of damage that it does to the body prior to the transplant, uh, you may or may not recover from it. So we talked about that quite extensively and, and she agreed with me, so she started pushing for the transplant. And um, she advocated both with Dr. Swartz and with, uh, um, through Dr. Swartz with Dr. Landsberg. So we pushed long enough that uh, Dr. Landsberg had granted me an initial interview and that was um, about 2010. And he listened to me and uh, said, well, you don't, you don't meet our criteria yet. He says, you have too much kidney function left. But one of the benefits that I had from that meeting is I did get the work uh, pre-transplant workup. I ended up getting 29 different inoculations prior to the transplant. So I, I got all that done and then they started donor search. I'm blessed coming from a, a large family because we searched the family and I think we had about 20 people apply to it. And out of the 20, I ended up with three valid donors. One was my sister, one was my aunt, one was my, my brother. We, they ended up taking my brother's kidney. The other side benefit from that is I had uh, three our relatives that had hidden medical problems that they didn't, weren't aware of. And uh, they ended up getting those treated before they became issues. So that's the other benefit of going in for that workup. It is extensive. We've definitely heard that before, that yeah. like, you know, family members going to get tested and they find out that, you know, they yeah. have markers for kidney disease or some other Well, heart issues. disease or something. Absolutely. It, it, it was amazing what they found out. Um, one uncle was, his gallbladder was going, he had no symptoms of it. So they took a gallbladder out before it got bad. The other one, he had a heart murmur he didn't know about. And it was quite severe and they ended up addressing that for him. So. The benefits uh, of applying to be a donor are sometimes hidden, and it, it did help my family. So the journey actually continued after that. In 2015, you met with Dr. David Landsberg again yes. to discuss a preemptive transplant. Well, to discuss, it wasn't preemptive at the time, it was to, to discuss my eligibility. So he remembered that I was there in 2010 and he looked at my file and noted that I still hadn't met their criteria. And um, I explained to him that I'd been graphing the decay of my kidney and that I'm not gonna meet their criteria until I was in my early 70s. So the problem that I had with being in my early 70s is, well, the two big issues, number one is, okay, my declining health, what's the outcome gonna be? I, I feel that I have a better opportunity to have a successful outcome when I'm younger. And then the second big issue is, well, what happens if my donors age out? Or they become ill or something, then I'm starting over on, on the, tra on the uh, donor front. So that was the, the first two issues that I raised. But then I went into the, the reason why I thought I, I should get the transplant is due to all the secondary issues I was having associated with the, with the kidney disease. Prior to my transplant, I was running into all sorts of different issues. Like I trained uh, for um, the half iron and I was fit enough to do the half iron yet 19 months later I couldn't climb a, a, a flight of stairs. And uh, I actually had quite a uh, serious breakdown mentally um, over that aspect because I didn't know what was wrong. And that started me on what I called the, it was almost like running in a wheel of going through all the different specialists. And uh, well, most of the specialists couldn't identify what the issue was. And finally I got to one specialist that says, well, there's nothing I could do for you because I know that much about this much. And he says that we're so narrow focused that you need somebody that's going to take, take it over from the top. And um, Dr. Whittington actually stepped in and sort of fulfilled that role. And she's the one that sort of guided me and help, help me educate myself so I, I could also act as my own advocate. So I had a professional advocate in one corner and then I can be quite assertive when I needed to, advocating for myself. And uh, that's when I, I put the list of all the secondary problems that I was running to and explained to Dr. Landsberg, well, I'm looking at more a quality of life. I said, I'm not looking for a transplant to extend my life, I want to enjoy what life I have left. And um, I think I talked for about 20 minutes steady and he just looked at me 
And uh, at the end of it, I says, well, what do you think? And he says, well, there's nothing I can argue with. You, you presented a very good case. And I says, well, what does that mean? He said, you'll have a kidney by Christmas. Alvin, thank you so much for sharing your story with us so far of living with NDI. Up next, Alvin is going to share his story about receiving a kidney transplant from a living donor. Can you imagine losing most of something without realizing it? Over time, kidney disease can destroy up to 80% of kidney function before you notice any symptoms. Talk to your family doctor to see if you're at risk and need to be screened. It could save your life. Okay, so transplant day arrives. Tell me what that was like for you and your brother. <laughs> uh, apprehension level were very, very high. <laughs> You know, I, I still remember the uh, signing off all of the disclaimers and the last one that stood out is, you know, the result could be death <laughs> and that's sort of what hang, hangs around. But uh, we went in, uh, I think we were in the hospital around six in the morning, getting the, uh, the work up, uh, getting prepared for the operation. Um, the other thing that I found is while I'm sitting there nervously on the gurney because I'd never been under a GA, I'd never had serious surgery up to that point. So the other part of my transplant that was different is I had a double nephrectomy because of the NDI. They took out both kidneys and then I, I had the transplant. And it's my understanding that um, Dr. Michael Ling, who was my surgeon, was pioneering a, uh, a new procedure. Initially, when I went in, they told me that I was going to have to undergo two operations. Uh, one to remove the kidneys and one to insert the transplant. Uh, Dr. Ng uh, removed both kidneys and completed the transplant uh, through a scar on my abdomen. It's about that long. And uh, it's, uh, well, they closed up the scar a lot better than what I had for the skin cancer so you can barely even see the scar. It, it was a, a, a pioneering surgery, is my understanding of the time, so I think I was on the table for under nine hours. Do you know what the normal time is for a kidney transplant? For the transplant itself, I'm not sure, okay. because uh, I also had the kidneys taken out, but exactly. originally they were saying that it'd be two operations that would be around 16 hours. So again, I'm off protocol. <laughs> So after the surgery, tell me about seeing your brother again post-transplant surgery. How did that feel? Oh, actually, the most wonderful part of the whole thing is coming out of the general anesthetic because I had my wife and my granddaughter sitting by my bedside when I come out of the GA. And you don't realize what's been taken away from you as you get ill over the years. And uh, because I had a functioning kidney, and I was well oxygenated. I woke up and my mind was hitting on all, all cylinders. I was taking in everything that I'd lost. And it was magical. It, it was, I was just euphoric. And I don't think it was the drugs that were doing it. It's because I could see, like one of the side, side effects that I had with the kidneys is that uh, my electrolyte levels were never stable. And one of the issues with uh, fluctuating electrolytes is they affect your vision. So I used to walk around with three pair of cheaters for reading glasses going up from 1.5 to two to two and a half. And depending on where my electrolyte levels were, I'd have to choose my glasses. So now I come out and I could actually see. <laughs> and that, that's the first thing, my hearing was clear. Um, I wasn't tired. And I'd always heard about these horrible hangovers coming from the GI, I, I didn't have any of it. And uh, that was the magical part of, of that. I didn't see my brother, he was in it. He'd uh, come through it a lot earlier, so he was out of the recovery room already on the ward. So I didn't see him for a day and a half later. What was the first thing you said to each other? I just told him, you know, I can't believe this. I, and he says, well, what do you mean? I says, well, I don't know, thank you. There, there's no way of repaying something like that. And he had a much rougher time 
uh, than I, you know, I did for the recovery. Some of it might have been our approach to recovery, but the other part of it is I gained something and I had something back where he lost something, had to give up something. So just to summarize, how long was the recovery process for both you and for your brother? Um, my brother was in the hospital for four days. I was in for six. Um, my recovery process, I went back to work February 1st. And um, I'm not sure when my brother went back, but uh, it took him probably another three or four weeks because he had post-op compl complications associated with his scar. So did he receive wage support from his employer? No. So that was all out of pocket for him? I think he had some support through the Kidney Foundation. Mm -hmm. We didn't apply for any. We were lucky that we were financially secure enough that we did not uh, suffer that badly from it. But there is a financial cost to it. So this year, you're coming up on celebrating your ninth kidney anniversary. Tell us about life post-transplant and what has that meant to you? Well, I always say that the, uh, the transplant gave me back 30 years of life. The only issue that I'm having right now is after eight years, the uh, immunosuppressants have got their claws firmly embedded in me. So I, I have to be a lot more careful around uh, getting other people's illnesses. So that's one of the things I'm learning to adjust to. Um, prior to the transplant, most of my problems medically were associated with either the gout or directly the kidney. I, I didn't catch a lot of the viruses. I had a, a fairly robust immune system. and So that, that's the only downside that I'm seeing. But compared to what I got back as far as uh, what I could do comfortably and the quality of life, it, it's a minor thing to pay for. That's incredible, so interesting. Stay with us, we'll be back with more. Do you want to reflect a little bit on living donation, how that's impacted your life, and the importance of increasing awareness on living organ donation? The, uh, the living donor is, uh, was a lifesaver for me. I know that originally when they started the transplants, the matches had to be fairly close. I know that the medical system is advanced now that they can basically do a non-matching kidney. Uh, when we were entering this process, my wife actually signed up to, she's different blood types, so she's not a match for me, but she signed up in the program that if we couldn't find a match, but they found a match uh, within the family, she would donate her kidney to somebody else and I would get their kidney in return. But the living donor program is going to save a lot of lives and it's going to bring back a lot of productivity into the world because uh, people suffering from kidney disease, um, well, it's fatal and it's debilitating on as you're going through it. Do you have any final thoughts or wisdom nuggets that you want to share with the audience? I think number one recommendation I would be is uh, Try to educate yourself to the fullest extent that you can so that you can be your own medical advocate. Treat the doctors with respect, but also question them. And uh, question them to the point that you understand what they're doing and why. I have not had any issue with any medical, medical professional in answering my questions. Some of them would, a uh, couple of them have tried to talk over my head, but I always recorded the conversation and then went back and did my research to find out and then the next time I seen them I would confirm that okay this is my understanding of what's going on am I correct or not and they would say yes and I found that understanding what I was going through helped me deal with the issues the final thing I would do is listen to the medical staff on on your recovery do what they tell you to do because if you step outside of that you're gonna end up paying a price what if they tell you that you're walking too much well he didn't tell me to stop <laughs> It was a suggestion. If he told me to stop, I would have listened to him. But, Fair enough, yeah. You know, that answer had to be black or white. There was no gray area because if there's a gray area, I'll take it to my advantage. <laughs> That's a good way to operate. <laughs> Any other final thoughts to share with us? Well, I really want to thank um, Dr. Winnington um, for her guidance, the care, and the fact that uh, she tutored me uh, through the process. And uh, I can't thank Dr. Landsberg enough for 
allowing me into the program when I didn't meet their strict protocol guidelines. It, uh, it really changed my life. The one person that I really need to thank, who I can never really thank, is my brother for donating his kidney. Uh, it's a gift of life that I could never repay. And my wife needs a special thank you as well because she stood by me through my kidney disease and all the trials and tribulations associated with the disease and the transplant. Plugged in wants to hear from you. Join us for a virtual one hour focus group. We're looking for individuals who've watched Kidney Plugged In and who'd be able to provide feedback on content that they like and what they would like to see as we build a future direction for content for the TV show. The focus group is part of an evaluation of Kidney Plugged In being conducted by Reichert & Associates, an independent evaluation firm. Focus group participants will be compensated $25 for their time and expertise shared. To register to take part in the Plugged In focus group, just scan the QR code on your screen or call 604-558-6883. It's just a minor irritant. I'm having more problems with just issues around aging. <laughs> so. Unfortunately, we're all facing yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alvin. Stay with us. <laughs> Thanks, Alvin. Stay with us. We'll be out. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and then you just say, okay. No, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the outtakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>